The advanced variation of the French defense is one of the most commonly used by White at every level. The goal is to maintain a space advantage and later exploit it to crush Black on the king's side. Black's chances typically involve putting pressure on the weakened d4 pawn. Additionally, since White has lost the move by playing e5, Black is often the first to start peace development, as in this case when we play knight c6. White, of course, develops and defends the pawn with knight f3. Now, instead of the most popular move queen b6, I'd like to suggest knight g e7. The idea is to play knight f5 and only then queen b6, putting serious pressure on d4. And this may lead to a quick success for black, as the attack on d4 is so swift that I often end up winning the d4 pawn just a couple of moves later. For instance, if white plays bishop e2 and castles, after queen b6 there is no way to protect the pawn, and black is nearly winning. If you're wondering about the consequences of white taking on c5, given the blocked f8 bishop, it turns out to be excellent for black after knight g6, simply regaining the pawn and ending up with a greater number of central pawns. For white, one of the main strategies is to firmly defend the d4 pawn and then utilize the space advantage to launch an attack on the king's side. This typically happens when white chooses a3 followed by b4, c takes d4 and then their bishop usually goes to b2, although sometimes it ends up even on e3, since the b2 pawn does not need to be protected. Not only does white successfully defend the base of the pawn chain, but they also gain a significant amount of space on the queen side. While they may not be planning to launch an attack there, their strategy serves to prevent any potential initiative that may come from black on the same flank. And what should we do as black? The first thing is to temporarily deviate from the typical plan of attacking the base of the pawn chain and instead target the top. The rationale is that white has passivized their bishop and wasted some time in creating the a3b4 formation. Therefore, we want to open the game with a well-timed f6, aiming to remove at least one of the two white central pawns. And here we see bishop d7 instead of the more natural bishop e7. The former works better because in case of bishop e7, white can play bishop d3, utilizing the well-known trick that ends with bishop b5 check resulting in a winning position for white. Opting for bishop d7 almost forces white to place their bishop on the less active e2 square. After castling, the typical move is queen d3, with an idea to develop their knight on d2. An immediate knight bd2 does not work, as the d4 pawn is not sufficiently defended. And this is the perfect moment to play f6. If white takes, bishop takes f6, adds another attacker against d4, leading to an easy game for black. If white continues with knight bd2, f takes e5, and after d takes e5, we have the beautiful move bishop e8, preparing to activate either on h5 or g6, resulting in an excellent position for black. Back to the situation after bishop d7. White can try to punish black for not developing the other bishop by playing g4, a strategy gaining popularity at the highest level. However, I'd always prefer black after retreating simply to e7. Then I'd push h5, play knight g6, eyeing the f4 square with an idea of putting the other knight on f5. It feels like black has achieved all positional goals in this scenario. Another way for white to solidify d4 is when the knight goes to c2 via a3. Two knights are employed to defend a critical d4 spot, ensuring that their dark square bishop is free on the c1h6 diagonal, ready to attack the black king and control dark squares. 
I'd like to suggest a rarely played but a very interesting plan for black here. The idea is going to be to provoke white to overprotect the default pawn and then switch to another target. Now this can be achieved by playing queen a5, provoking bishop d2 and then executing a peculiar plan and maneuver with the move queen b6, further provoking bishop c3. Now white ends up in an absurd situation, I would say, where almost everything they have is engaged in defending the default weakness, making it difficult for them to exert pressure on our kingside. We will continue with the move bishop e7, and white is free to play the optimal bishop d3 now, and is searching for the perfect moment to trade on f5. However, we can choose to ignore that and see some space on the queen side. In the event that white immediately takes an f5, it is perfectly fine for black. With uh, one bishop on e6 and the other one on e7, we have the flexibility to play on both sides. g5 on the king's side, and knight b4 or a4 followed by knight a5 c4 on the queen's side. Meanwhile, white's pieces appear somewhat awkward as they are still overprotecting d4. And awkward can easily turn into ugly for white if they fail to understand the needs of their position. For instance, if they castle here, they are already worse because black plays on an unexpected move f4 followed by g5. Suddenly black leads the kingside attack supported by the two bishops. Just keep this in mind for later since we're gonna talk about this plan again. Now let's turn to the main line and the move bishop d3. In this position, black cannot play knight f5 immediately as white can take and then capture on c5, creating multiple weaknesses in the black camp. Among them, d5 pawn becomes vulnerable on the open file and that's why we first trade on d4 and then move the knight to f5. Now, white's only reasonable option is to trade, hoping to exploit potential weaknesses in black's pawn structure. On the other side, black considers that the d5 pawn is well covered by the white d4 pawn in front and can be easily defended by the light square bishop on e6. Additionally, the f5 pawn serves as a solid defender on the king's side. And another advantageous aspect for black is that white is left without their light square bishop, which is typically the best attacker in the French defense. Interestingly, black often gets a chance to attack on the king's side in this variation. In my experience, many players opt to castle, which is already a mistake, shifting the evil bar in black's favor. This oversight, I think, is coming from white neglecting the potential of black organizing a pawn storm on the king's side, thanks to the f5 pawn. Black normally goes with bishop e7, then bishop e6, pushes g5, and at a certain point advances f4. Typically I'd cast a short, place my king on h8, play rook g8, possibly rook g6, mobilizing pieces simply to the king's side. And I cannot recall losing a game when white castles too soon like this. Instead, they should delay castling and play an immediate knight c3. This move provokes bishop e6 to protect d5. Here, again, white should not castle, but rather play either h4 or knight e2. Both of these moves are crucial for white as h4 prevents black's ideas of advancing g5 and supports the knight coming to f4 via e2. Now this f4 knight can be the best piece for white, almost impossible to remove. However, at this point, it is more precise for white to play knight e2, as in the case of h4, Richard Rapport recently found a positional stunner, bishop b4. The idea is that after trading on c3, white cannot bring their knight to f4. In general, under this pawn structure and almost close center, knights are often superior to bishops. 
So playing knight e2 avoids bishop b4. We respond with bishop e7, and when white plays h4, it is crucial for black to follow up with h6. A common mistake, as I experienced against international master Misha Pap, is to neglect this move. White can play then bishop g5, or seeing the exchange of bishops. After this exchange, black is left seriously worse due to the weaknesses on the dark squares. After h6, white usually continues with knight f4. Now in response, I like playing g6 to prevent white from playing h5. Now this move serves well if we plan to castle long later and advance g5 at a certain point. For instance, after white plays king f1, which is a strategic way to get the king to safety while keeping the h rook in a potentially useful position, perhaps lifting to h3, we can consider queen b6. Now this move not only eyes d4, but also prepares for castling long. We might follow up with the king b8 and later decide whether to go for a kingside attack with rook dg8 and g5, or take more positional approach with rook c8, knight a5, trying to grab initiative on the queen side. The game remains balanced, in my opinion.